Good evening. Mr. Prime Minister, I would like to welcome you and thank you for accepting this invitation by Innovative Greeks and the opportunity you give us today to have this discussion about innovation and the transformation of the Greek economy. The IG initiative brings together more than 9,000 people, maybe more than 10,000 people from many different countries, especially the US. The message of the Greek transformation is also international, hence our discussion will be in English. Innovative Greeks is a collaboration between seven Endeavour to create a community for Greeks around the world who want to be part of the Greek transformation narrative. We would like to summarize our discussion today into three main subjects, leveraging the Greek diaspora, boosting innovation capacity and attracting foreign direct investment. And with that, I would like to ask Dimitris Papalexopoulos, chairman of SEVT, um, to join me with his first question. Dimitri. Thank you, Costanza, and thank you for joining us, Prime Minister. It, it has been a, a recurring lament over decades that the Greek economy has been unable to benefit anywhere near as much as it could and should from the sizable and highly successful Greek diaspora. And it's certainly not because of lack of interest or goodwill from Greeks abroad. The quality of the panelists we had the chance to witness a few minutes ago, who readily agreed to participate in this event, the fact that over 10,000 Greeks have already signed up to engage in the Innovative Greeks platform demonstrates that this once again. So the problems are clearly deeper and more systemic. So I would put it to you that the timing is as good as it has ever been to break decisively with the past. Disruption is creating new opportunities. Access to technology is being democratized. Local ecosystems are growing. Financing is more readily available. Easy, easy connectivity provides a big boost. The brain drain community that has painfully emerged over the past decade is actually in some ways an enabler. And even the pandemic is only useful, is useful in accelerating things. So your government and you personally have shown appreciation of those challenges and opportunities involved and have acted in this direction. So the question we would like to start off with, what do you think should be our level of ambition? Can we do plus 10% or can we think 10x? How can we transcend the infamous Greek reality and scale up meaningfully? Uh, first of all, Costanza and Dimitri, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Um, uh, you gave me to participate uh, in what I understand is a very, very interesting uh, online discussion. Uh, I gather that you have thousands of people participating from all over the world. Uh, and this, I think, is particularly encouraging because it uh, shows a level of uh, engagement with what is happening uh, in Greece, which, um, uh, in my mind, is a clear sign of optimism regarding our ability to take the country forward in big leaps. Uh, our government is not a government that is focused on uh, incremental change. Uh, our ambitions uh, are much more substantial. I think this is a once in a generation opportunity uh, to totally transform the country, the fabric of its economy. Uh, uh, and uh, the way we view uh, ourselves, our relationship uh, uh, with the state, but also the opportunities um, uh, we give to our people um, uh, to grow and uh, flourish. Uh, and if I can just make a bridge with the, uh, uh, the, the organization that is uh, uh, sponsoring this online debate, uh, can we turn the innovative Greeks uh, into an innovative Greece? Uh, what is it that makes uh, uh, Greeks uh, flourish abroad? Uh, while when they return to Greece uh, or when they, uh, or for those who stay in Greece, they feel constrained by uh, a system that uh, cannot uh, unleash their uh, degree of creativity. I think this is a fundamental question that we uh, need to, uh, to answer. Uh, and uh, we need to be bold in the way we, we do things and in, in thinking in a completely different manner. We uh, are not going to change the country dramatically if we keep on doing um, uh, things the same way as we did them in, uh, in the past. And you mentioned the pandemic, which in my mind uh, is uh, in, in the midst of this 
um, horrific uh, healthcare crisis, uh, it is also a tremendous uh, opportunity uh, to transform the way we engage you know, with the public sector, uh, to reprioritize uh, public health as an important value, but also as a, a policy um, uh, priority. Uh, and uh, at the same time, to make sure that uh, we uh, unleash uh, creative uh, forces um, which uh, are by nature disruptive. Now, just two examples, which I'm sure we may touch upon as the discussion uh, continues. Uh, it was mentioned in, uh, in the previous uh, panel uh, that uh, Estonia at one point uh, set the bar very high when it came to its own leadership uh, in e-government. But I can tell you that what is happening uh, right now in Greece in terms of the digital transformation uh, of the state is completely groundbreaking. Um, for years, we've been talking about facilitating the interaction between citizens and businesses with the state using technology. We've actually made it happen and there is still much more to do, but we've demonstrated that this is something actually that we can do. Uh, look at the way we deliver our, uh, our vaccine program. Uh, it's fully digital. We notify people uh, through an SMS. They, they book their appointment. Uh, if they need to change, they go online and, and change it. And once they show up, in one of the vaccination um, uh, centers we've set up, they're treated uh, with uh, dignity and respect, and everyone seems very happy uh, with the way um, uh, we are rolling out this extremely complex um, um, uh, process. I'm saying all this because it is particularly important if we want to really change uh, the country and think in terms of 10x rather than 10% uh, incremental change, that we build a level of trust between the state, between the political elites, and between the citizens, which clearly was not there um, over, I'd say, many decades. And certainly that, that level of trust uh, was actually shattered uh, by, uh, by the crisis. Uh, so uh, I'm a big believer in, in trust as, as a social capital that drives countries forward. And I think during the pandemic, in spite of the great difficulties, we've taken uh, important steps uh, in that direction. Um, starting from 2017, not only the number of Greeks um, emigrating abroad got stabilized, uh, but also the number of Greeks returning to the homeland um, increased. Last year, almost 130,000 people returned, and most of them are people with a higher educational, education degree. So there are signs that we are moving from brain drain to brain regain. What are your thoughts um, on, uh, on how to accelerate that trend? Well, um, as, as you know, and as many, many of the people who, uh, many of our friends who follow this discussion uh, know, uh, a lot of young, talented people had to leave uh, Greece over the past the decade in search uh, of uh, better opportunities. They left primarily because uh, there were not enough jobs uh, in Greece or the, the jobs that were offered um, uh, did not satisfy the people who actually left Greece uh, uh, on, uh, on various uh, you know, fronts. And I think it is very, very encouraging that uh, many of those who have left uh, are, are contemplating to return to, uh, to Greece. And they will do so for various reasons. Uh, obviously, the Greek economy will need to uh, create uh, uh, good-paying jobs that satisfy uh, the, uh, the ambitions of, of people who can actually choose to return to Greece because they now have an opportunity to um, pursue employment uh, abroad. So creating new jobs uh, in, uh, in those areas where the country, those fields where the country has a comparative advantage uh, is uh, particularly important. Uh, but it's not just that. I think if someone uh, decides to return to, to Greece after having spent uh, many years uh, abroad, they will not just look uh, at the job they can get in Greece. They will also look at the broader context. Uh, they will look at issues such as quality of life, whether this is a truly meritocratic um, country. At the end of the day, it's going to be a vote of confidence in the long-term perspective and in the long-term um, um, uh, ambitions of the country. And I think the reason why many people are contemplating to return uh, to Greece now is because they honestly believe, and I honestly believe the same thing, is that we've turned the corner and that we're at the beginning of a long-term growth cycle that will truly uh, transform uh, the country. And I do encourage uh, Greeks uh, abroad to, to be part of this new chapter 
uh, of Greek history because we need their skills. Uh, we need uh, uh, their innovative uh, talents. We need their experiences uh, abroad. Uh, and at a time when maybe the scarcest form of capital uh, is human capital, uh, this uh, talent pool that we have, the people who um, uh, are living abroad and are looking to return um, uh, to, um, uh, to, to Greece, provide us with a significant comparative advantage. And we might also want to make it easy for these people to return. That is why we've set up uh, various uh, tax schemes uh, for people who have been tax residents abroad, if they choose to, um, uh, to return to Greece, to have uh, favorable tax treatments. That is why we are reducing um, uh, taxes uh, on, on high earners, uh, abolishing the solidarity surcharge, reducing social security contributions, because at the end of the day, we want to make it more attractive for employees and for employers to pay good wages. And we want to be competitive. Uh, if um, uh, you know, your after-tax uh, income in Greece uh, is uh, in a position of significant disadvantage vis-a-vis uh, -vis another country, you may think twice about uh, returning to Greece. So I do think, Ostanza, that uh, uh, the stars are, are aligned uh, for appealing uh, to the Greek diaspora uh, and, uh, and ask them to seriously consider to return to Greece. And, you know, in these days of, of mobile labor, they may not even need to return permanently. I think one of the great advantages of Greece in the post-pandemic era uh, is exactly related to the fact that uh, it has been proven that you can work from, uh, from anywhere. Uh, Greece offers, uh, you know, a safe environment, excellent connectivity, fantastic uh, uh, quality uh, of uh, life. Uh, so uh, we are also uh, appealing not just to Greeks, but to non-Greeks who want to uh, relocate to Greece or to spend a significant amount of their time uh, in Greece. Uh, we should, you should be very ambitious. Greece should be the best place in the world to work from, um, whether you're Greek or non-Greek. And this is opening up a whole new uh, uh, array of opportunities also for the economy to create new jobs, attract new investments uh, and grow um, uh, significantly over the next years. Let me perhaps add to what you said, Prime Minister, that there, is, there are several indications that your steps to invite non-Greeks to come to Greece as well, there's anecdotal evidence that there's several taking advantage of that. But let me come back to the, the brain drainers, if I can, for a minute. Some of them will probably elect not to, to return. And I've heard the argument made that maybe that's a, a positive thing for Greece in some ways. How can we make the best of the ones who elect to stay there despite everything? Can we do more? Of, of, of course we can. And it is clear that not everyone is going to, uh, not everyone is going to return. Uh, first of all, we want Greeks to be involved in Greek affairs. Uh, and there are various ways of doing this. Uh, we uh, uh, made sure that we fulfilled our commitment to allow Greeks to vote from where they reside, rather than uh, having to return to Greece, you know, pay for a ticket uh, and make the trip in order to participate uh, in the electoral process. I think this is an important step uh, to make sure that uh, Greeks who live abroad uh, become more engaged in the, in the political um, uh, process. In an interconnected world, um, uh, we need to create uh, networks uh, that uh, leverage the expertise uh, of, uh, of Greeks in various sectors where they can add significant value um, to the country. Let me just give you one example. We have incredibly talented Greeks, uh, as you know, active in the healthcare sector. Uh, uh, many of them very active in the United States, um, you know, some of them leading, you know, companies uh, um, uh, that are also um, uh, very much in the news because of their active participation uh, in, uh, in, in the vaccine uh, um, uh, effort against uh, COVID. We have created, and I've created at my level, uh, a network of, uh, of, of Greeks or people who are related in one way or another um, uh, to Greece who um, uh, advise us uh, on the next generation uh, of, uh, of healthcare uh, and how we can take advantage of the momentous changes uh, happening in uh, the healthcare industry and the fusion between healthcare uh, and technology. So one doesn't necessarily need to return to Greece uh, to add uh, uh, value to, to the country, as long as they have an interest uh, you know, in helping their country, either with their knowledge or with their capital, because we're also appealing, obviously, 
um, uh, to Greeks uh, abroad to uh, invest in the country, you know, be it from a small investment, it could be a real estate investment, to much more significant um, uh, productive uh, investments. And we make the case to Greeks and non-Greeks alike that Greece is becoming an attractive uh, investment destination. Uh, last but not least, uh, uh, I think civic engagement, non-profit work uh, these days um, uh, is particularly uh, important. It's another venue, uh, another path for Greeks uh, abroad uh, can become engaged in what is happening in, uh, in Greece based on their own uh, personal sensitivities uh, and uh, uh, interests. Uh, uh, Endeavor is a global uh, non-profit uh, organization that has been established in Greece and is doing uh, you know, a fantastic job um, working uh, with the Greek uh, startup uh, ecosystem uh, and uh, providing knowledge and support to aspiring young entrepreneurs. One can provide value, value by serving as a mentor to a young company from, uh, from abroad. It's so easy now to do it with, uh, uh, you know, with, with the new uh, communication uh, technology. So there are numerous ways. If you're interested, there are numerous ways of actually helping um, uh, the, the country. And by helping the country, I don't just mean helping the, uh, the government, uh, you know, help businesses, help civic society, um, uh, and uh, be, be part of this uh, a new vision that is being, uh, you know, articulated about where the, the country is, uh, is going. And we should remember that this is an important date for the country. Uh, we're celebrating 200 years since the beginning of the Greek Revolution, so it's a good opportunity to look back uh, and to assess uh, you know, the times when we were successful, but also to chart uh, a course uh, into, into the future. So this is not just about you know, celebrating what we have achieved, and I think we've achieved a lot as a, as a nation state, uh, but also to really uh, chart the course uh, for, uh, you know, for an ambitious uh, next, uh, next decade. Uh, despite the unprecedented circumstances we all went through and this disruption in almost all businesses, 2020 has been a great year for Greek innovation. We saw a record number of acquisitions for Greek technology companies that reached almost $500 million. The Greek startups raised a record level of capital. Endeavor estimates this number to be more than $350 million in just 2020. And at the same time, multiple research centers of excellence were established by large multinationals. However, innovation is not only about technology, it's a mindset. It's not just an aspirational goal, it's the capacity to successfully adapt. New business models lead to diversified products or new services that accelerate growth. Innovation has become now maybe more relevant than any other period because adversity sometimes forces societies to advance and accelerates, um, and accelerates change. So we have an opportunity here, a crisis that should not be wasted. It is widely accepted that if we are to aim to sustainable long-term growth in a way that could lift living standards, then increasing our collective capacity to innovate is an imperative. This obviously touches a radical rethink of our educational system, better link between universities and business, an exponential leap in upskilling and reskilling, more emphasis on R&D and our efforts to help the companies to scale up. And in all these, governments have an important role to play. So what are your plans, Mr. Prime Minister? What are your, your priorities for raising Greece's innovation capacity? Oh, where, where shall I start? I mean, you, you touched upon uh, various uh, very, very uh, important uh, themes. Uh, first of all, let me uh, add my, my congratulations uh, to those uh, you know, startup companies that have uh, succeeded in taking you know, the next step for, um, um, uh, forward. Uh, um, uh, uh, because uh, as you pointed out, it is evidence that Greece now, after lots of effort, uh, has a vibrant uh, uh, ecosystem um, uh, uh, of startup companies, uh, not just technology companies, but companies that uh, innovate in general. And it also has a vibrant venture capital uh, scene with uh, um, uh, venture capital funds that have been co-funded by, by European funds. And this is only one indication of how uh, the government can uh, support uh, innovation and the startup um, uh, ecosystem. So I'm very, very happy that uh, during the crisis, uh, many Greeks uh, um, discovered the beauty of entrepreneurship and that uh, entrepreneurship is no longer a 
tarnished uh, concept uh, as it was uh, maybe in, uh, in previous uh, decades, and that it is something that actually um, young Greeks aspire to. Because as, as we know, Greeks have been, and as we've discussed during you know, the opening of our session, Greeks have been incredibly successful uh, as innovators, uh, as business creators abroad. Why shouldn't this uh, also happen in Greece? And this is my, my personal passion, my personal vision, maybe because I spent my, most of my professional career in venture capital before I entered politics. I sort of now see us at last catching up with what I was hoping to do maybe 15 years ago when Greek society uh, was maybe not uh, uh, ready uh, at, uh, at the time. Uh, I think it is very important that we are teaching, that we're beginning to teach entrepreneurship at schools. Uh, and uh, it's fascinating uh, every, every time we uh, engage um, you know, our teenagers uh, in innovative projects, you know, be it virtual businesses or robotics competitions, how, how much uh, genuine talent and enthusiasm uh, is, 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 is exuded through these, uh, uh, through these processes. Uh, and uh, I think our, our young generation is incredibly talented. Uh, and once they, they go to university um, in Greece, we need to make sure, as you pointed out, that uh, universities are much more connected with uh, a real life and with real businesses. Uh, and for those who don't go to university, we need to make sure that we give them the necessary uh, vocational training and uh, opportunities and technical education that they can also uh, aspire uh, to, to, to be able to be successful <laughs> and why not to innovate and create, uh, and create businesses. As far as technology is concerned, we do know that our public universities are producing um, uh, incredibly talented and well-trained uh, uh, young graduates. And I think that is also why uh, a lot of uh, foreign companies are looking to come to Greece to set up innovation centers because they know that they can tap into uh, a pool of human capital uh, that is hardworking, um, ambitious, and very, very talented. And this is happening not just in Athens, uh, it's happening in Thessaloniki, it's happening in Yanena, it's happening in Iraklion, it's happening in Chania, it's happening in, in, in cities that have you know, universities with a strong technical background. And this, I think, is, uh, is, is incredibly uh, encouraging. Uh, and of course, there are many other ways that we need to uh, foster and uh, strengthen innovation. Um, uh, dear Dimitri, as president of, of SEV, you know that Greek businesses need to invest more in R&D uh, because uh, uh, a, lot of the, um, uh, a lot of the innovation is privately driven and we've given additional tax incentives uh, to private businesses to invest more in R&D. And of course, we also need to streamline our public funding uh, of, uh, of research uh, by setting up also technology centers of excellence. We are with uh, uh, the Deputy Minister for Innovation launching a, a very ambitious project for taking over uh, an abandoned uh, um, factory um, towards Piraeus to create you know, a, a true innovation hub uh, in, uh, uh, in, in Athens. Uh, that will fuse uh, research and startup uh, activities. So, uh, and this is not a real estate project in itself, but it's an opportunity to create, you know, a concentrated uh, ecosystem that will foster uh, innovation. Uh, and of course, we need to let universities, public universities, um, uh, 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 so we need to let them free uh, to to cooperate uh, with uh, the private sector uh, and uh, make sure that they establish these links, which. In the past, unfortunately, by many were considered anathema, um, uh, which is a very, very distorted way of looking at how uh, higher public education uh, needs, to, uh, needs to function. Uh, and, uh, uh, of course, one always uh, one should never forget that uh, innovation, as you pointed out, Costanza, is not just about technology. Um, uh, you can have extremely innovative companies that simply reinvent you know, basic business models. There is probably going to be a technological component to any innovation, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to have a patent and you need to invent something, um, um, either in terms of hardware uh, or in terms of uh, software. It also means using you know, existing tools uh, in, uh, in a different um, uh, manner. So uh, I think the, the opportunities are really um, significant, but what I most appreciate is this buzz coming out of the startup uh, uh, ecosystem uh, and the number of young people 
who rather than seeking unemployment maybe in the public sector, yeah. as was the case, um, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, are thinking about becoming entrepreneurs, becoming innovators. I'm not saying that we don't need talented people in the public sector. We will always need highly talented people uh, in the public sector, uh, and we seek to hire them through purely meritocratic um, uh, procedures. Uh, but uh, this level of, um, uh, of ambition that uh, you can do anything, you can set up a successful startup uh, out, of, uh, out of Greece, uh, uh, is something which uh, I, I see for the first time. And uh, frankly, it is tremendously uh, encouraging and highly, highly optimistic. Uh, you've opened up for your answer a series of further questions, and, and if you will allow us, we'll stick with innovation for a bit longer. Um, l let me um, perhaps focus a little more on, on, on education and skills. I think, as you pointed out, our universities have a long positive transition, uh, tra tradition in, in the vitally important areas of, of science, technology, engineering, and, and mathematics, STEM. Yet, in, in a country today where 42% of young people have a university education, and unemployment still exceeds 15%, over one-third of Greek companies tell us every day that they have a hard time finding the right people to hire. So how do we reconcile this apparent contradiction? Is it, is it about scaling up knowledge of, of data science and modernizing our STEM? Uh, curriculum? Is it a question of scaling up? Or is it maybe more about the soft skills of the 21st century, the creativity, communication, collaboration, critical thinking, the four C's that are increasingly thought of as key components of modern education? Could you share some more thoughts on what we should be doing on the education and upskilling side? I think it's, uh, I think it's probably both. Um, uh, there are, there are lots of things that we still need to do in terms of our public education uh, system. Essentially, starting with uh, uh, kindergarten, looking at the way you know, our schools function, um, uh, the curriculum, the way we teach our kids uh, those skills which we know are so important in the 21st uh, uh, century. You know, and then uh, what is it that they actually uh, learn at university? How do they actually choose what to study? I consider that to be of paramount uh, importance. And one of the legislative changes that we introduced, Dimitri, in, the, in the, the recent law we passed on higher education is exactly looking at this, maybe encouraging uh, our 17 or 18 year olds to slightly limit their choice of schools where they, uh, where they apply to uh, in order for them to uh, have a higher probability to study something that they really care uh, and, uh, and love. I don't believe in the value of a degree simply for the sake of, of obtaining a university degree if you end up studying something which you have zero interest in. And we also know that the rate of dropouts and the, the, uh, you know, the students that don't graduate, if they end up uh, in a school where they just don't, simply don't care about uh, what, what they study uh, is, is high. So we need to look at, uh, uh, you know, uh, at essentially re-engineering um, uh, our entire um, uh, education system starting from uh, our schools. Um, and that is why these uh, soft skills, which we're beginning to tentatively introduce uh, in our curriculum, are so important. Uh, this is no longer, education is no longer about memorizing knowledge. You know, we can look at, you know, look up any bit, any piece of information is, is freely available. Uh, it's about uh, critical thinking, it's about learning how to express yourself, learning how to write, learning how to um, cooperate, uh, learning uh, how to, to, to be able to um, overcome diff difficulties, um, you know, be, uh, uh, be resilient. And all these are skills that we need to teach our kids, uh, starting with our schools. Obviously, we also teach our kids at, uh, at home, but we need to teach these skills at, uh, at, at school. And uh, th that involves, um, you know, a it's fundamental reassessment uh, of our uh, of our public education system, and it's going to take time. These are not uh, easy uh, easy changes. Uh, uh, and when it comes to our uh, universities, but also our schools, you know, evaluation uh, is uh, you know is, is obviously particularly important. You know, I've been rather unapologetic 
in terms of uh, explaining to our universities that a certain component of funding will be tied to um, uh, you know, uh, independent assessment of their, um, uh, of their performance. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, there are aspects and, 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 and fields where we know that uh, there will be you know, a greater demand, uh, such as data sciences, which obviously need to be further strengthened and we need to increase capacity uh, in, uh, in those uh, um, uh, fields. And of course, then there is the, the issue of lifelong training, uh, of uh, acquiring skills post-university, uh, of retraining, of what we call you know, upskilling uh, or reskilling, where the private sector can also add significant value. Um, how do you confer, um, convert you know, a STEM graduate uh, who may have studied uh, you know, mathematics uh, into a programmer? Um, uh, and what sort of additional training uh, uh, and certification can you, can you give to such a person in order to use their fundamental sort of scientific knowledge in a more productive uh, direction? Um, and uh, I need to point out that uh, there are significant European funds also available through uh, what we call the Recovery and Resilience Fund that we intend to direct uh, into that uh, um, priority of, uh, of strengthening uh, our labor force and making sure that uh, especially our young people, but also, uh, you know, um, uh, citizens that, uh, uh, you know, there are, uh, you know, that have significant work experience can acquire uh, new skills that will increase their probability of uh, um, uh, leading a successful um, uh, professional career. Uh Mr. Prime Minister, because you, you threw down the gauntlet to the private sector justifiably on two issues, both insufficient R&D and indirectly not investing enough in upskilling our, our people and investing in, in, in developing our people. And, and I think the, the statistics clearly show that you are right. And this is an area of responsibility we have to, to work, work in as, as companies, as a private sector. Having said that, it is partly a reflection of the structure of the Greek economy. So 62% of, of the workforce is employed by small companies. Or to look at it inversely, only 12% of the Greek labor force is in companies of over 250 people each, versus 33% in, in the European Union. So it, the question is, and, and I, it's obviously not easy, but how do we shift the structure so as to increase the number of companies that have the critical mass to compete internationally, to invest in R&D, to develop people? Well, yes, we, we, we need bigger companies. And there are two ways to grow a company. One is to grow organically, um, which is really the company's, the company's job. The other way is to grow through you know, collaborations. Uh, um, um, mergers, um, uh, acquisitions, uh, and we probably need, you know, a package to make um, uh, these, uh, um, uh, uh, so these, these, these types of, of transactions um, more, uh, uh, more attractive in order to, uh, to create the necessary uh, scale. Uh, but uh, there is also, I may sort of go slightly against the, uh, against the trend to, to argue that uh, um, sometimes small can also be beautiful uh, in the sense that uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can see companies that may be small. Look at, for example, you know, a small, um, you know, cozy family-run uh, uh, hotel that is focusing on uh, uh, sustainability and, and, focus and offering real, um, uh, real quality um, uh, to, its, um, uh, to its visitors. Uh, being uh, you know a very you know successful business uh, in its in, in, in its own right, so it doesn't mean that all companies, by definition, need to be big to be successful. And for example, look at the COVID uh, experience, where interestingly enough, a lot of smaller companies who actually knew their customers well, regional shops, if you gave them the right tools, actually maybe adapted easier than larger companies that were tied up in complicated supply chains. So not everything in the Greek economy is going to be, uh, is going to be um, uh, big. Uh, there are companies that may be, um, and business ventures that may be uh, 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 very successful and, and provide you know, a very decent uh, uh, income to the owners and their employees by staying you know, relatively uh, relatively small. For example, you know, a quality restaurant may never be able to grow because, you know, that's what 
you know, as a sort of, um, you know, a, a, you know, a, a good chef can um, uh, can do. Um, uh, but of course, there is, you know, the, the other aspect is that uh, clearly uh, in areas such as manufacturing, um, um, uh, where we can do we, we can do much more uh, to add up scale. Uh, we need to be certain that we provide the right framework for uh, for incentives in order for companies to grow. And sometimes this growth has to come not just through organic growth; it has to come through um, uh, through uh, through mergers, um, uh, through maybe accepting uh, you know private capital to invest uh, in uh, in the company. And, and maybe sometime you know the the owner of a company may choose to have a smaller share in a bigger company than a bigger share in a smaller company. And, you know, knowing the, the psyche of Greek entrepreneurs and Greek business people, you know, Dimitri, this is not always easy to accept. Well aware. One last question this, in this topic before we move um, uh, for the FDI. Um, how can Greece capitalize the opportunities for international partnerships like uh, those with Pfizer, Microsoft, Amazon? In other words, how can Greece become a regional, um, a regional innovation hub? Well, I think uh, it's already happening. Uh, and it's happening because all these companies took a hard look at Greece, compared the opportunity to invest in Greece with the opportunity to invest in other countries and decided that it's worthwhile to invest in Greece. Uh, and for many of these companies, that would have been inconceivable a few years ago. Various reasons why this is uh, happening. I think uh, uh, you know, these big multinational companies feel comfortable with uh, you know, a government and I don't, I don't like the, the necessarily to use the term pro-business, but a, a government that is reliable and keeps its word uh, and is committed to making the life of foreign investors uh, easier. And of course, as we, uh, as we discussed, I think they appreciated um, uh, the intrinsic comparative advantages uh, of the country, uh, access to human capital being uh, you know, a very, very important one. So, you know, sometimes this is acting, you know, you, you just need, you know, a couple of big investments to act as a snowball effect and to actually um, um, uh, uh, become part of the, um, of the international investment map. And I think this is already happening in Greece. People are looking at Greece uh, uh, for investments, not necessarily just in those sectors where they always wanted to invest in Greece, um, such as tourism. Look at the Pfizer example, you know, they set up a big data center. Uh, in, uh, in Thessaloniki, and they're not the only uh, example of, uh, of companies that uh, are looking to uh, invest uh, uh, in, in data science and, uh, uh, you know, employ talented Greeks and pay good, uh, good salaries. Uh, Pfizer is only um, uh, one example of company that has actually uh, done that. So there will be uh, numerous uh, opportunities uh, um, uh, for, uh, for companies to look at Greece. Uh, other companies may look at Greece uh, for, uh, you know, um, uh, as a regional hub um, uh, for shared services, what we used to call uh, back office, uh, because uh, of Greece's excellent uh, connectivity. Uh, we shouldn't forget that Greece uh, uh, is uh, centrally, you know, uh, located in terms of being close to the Balkans, being close to the Middle East, being closer than other countries to to eastern uh, to eastern Africa, so this uh, being closer to India, which uh, in my mind is uh, is, a, is a completely new untapped um, market for Greek companies, but also for investors from India to come uh, into Greece. So our, our geographic location uh, uh, is, uh, is is a big advantage to also act, uh, attract companies that are looking um, uh, to set up um, regional uh, headquarters, and this is also uh, beginning to happen. Which is a wonderful transition to, to coming to the issue of, of uh, foreign direct investment and reforms. So uh, investment at scale is imperative if we are to increase the metabolic rate of the growth of the Greek economy. Gross investments in 2019 were a little over 10% of GDP versus, versus an average of over 20% at the European Union. And this leaves a gap of maybe 20 billion euros a year. And clearly, foreign direct investment needs to be a big part of that mix. It not only helps plug the gap, but brings additional benefits in terms of connecting the Greek economy with the global supply chains, boosting exports, creating clusters, like Costanza mentioned, that have a multiplier effect and develop talent. So after a very tough decade, Greece's image is on the mend. Trust, as you mentioned earlier, has increased. 
buoyed by a successful handling of the pandemic and the investor friendliness of a reform-oriented government. Foreign direct investment has, is up tenfold since 2010 uh, uh, at about four and a half billion the year before COVID. And recent high profile deals uh, bear your personal uh, imprint. Yet investors are spoiled for choice and Greece has a long way to go to become an attractive foreign direct investment destination. And there are those that worry that the economic costs of the pandemic risks blunting your government's willingness to push ahead with needed reforms. What do you tell them? And what reforms are you prioritizing in order to attract foreign direct investment? Well, um, first of all, I would uh, tell those who are concerned about, about us deviating from our reform path to look at our record. We passed more than 150 pieces of legislation since we took over, uh, many of them uh, in line with our uh, electoral commitment to drastically change the country, uh, and many of them related to, the, um, to our priority of attracting investment, domestic and foreign, uh, to, um, to Greece. So uh, under no circumstance uh, has the pandemic derailed uh, our primary uh, task. Of course, all countries will be hit with a significant uh, you know, recession uh, in, uh, in 2020. Uh, uh, but this is a systemic uh, you know, um, uh, uh, shock to all economies. Uh, and if anything, as we discussed, it, it may present Greece with also opportunities to rebrand itself and also opens up a new path um, for opportunities that were not present before the, the pandemic. But we know what foreign investors uh, are really um, uh, looking at. You know, a stable political environment, I think we can guarantee that. We have an absolute majority uh, in, uh, in Parliament. Uh, we can take decisions quickly. We are not engaged in sort of coalition um, discussions. I think this is an advantage for the country uh, at this given point. We are almost halfway through our term. Uh, we are doing rather well in the polls, which means that uh, I think in spite of the difficulties, Greeks uh, recognize that uh, we are um, uh, moving the country uh, in the right direction. And of course, uh, you know, if you look at under the, you know, the, 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 the important topic of political risk and political stability, the fact that the country is no longer a, a European outlier, uh, no longer you know, a problem child, is, is very, very important. Uh, Greece is punching above its weight in Europe now. Nobody is talking you know, to Greece or about Greece uh, in the context of us having to deal, you know, with a debt crisis, you know, reforms that are not happening, uh, all these, we've left all this behind. And it happened very, very quickly. And it is particularly uh, uh, important for Greece because you know how much bad press we have, re we have received for almost a, uh, a decade. So this rebranding happened very quickly. Uh, and I think it is particularly important for the image of the country as a whole. Then you look at issues such as uh, regulation. Um, uh, we are, for example, as we speak, passing, uh, I'm sure you're aware, uh, a new legislation on public procurement, you know, in line with, um, uh, you know, with the European directives, simplifying issues regarding public uh, uh, procurement, which made it uh, too complicated uh, and too difficult for companies to participate uh, in, uh, uh, in tenders. Uh, we've done a significant amount of work in terms of reducing the tax burden. Um, we are simplifying uh, regulation across the board. We have, uh, we've managed to unblock, you know, important investments such as, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the old, uh, uh, you know, Elinikon Airport, which seemed like, uh, you know, the Gordian knot. Nobody could actually deal with them. And, and, it, it, and it is moving forward. If you look at what's happening uh, in the real estate market in Greece uh, across the board, I think we're just at the beginning uh, of a long-term uh, uh, upward uh, uh, trend. Uh, so, we, uh, and if you also look at how this, all this is going to be reflected in the doing business indices, uh, once it will be published, I think we will be very pleasantly surprised. And obviously these are data that uh, many international uh, investors uh, look at when they decide uh, how, where to invest. And of course, just to complete from where we started, we also have lots of, um, uh, you know, lots of Greeks in the diaspora, 
uh, who may you know pitch in um, and uh, amplify our story. And it is important for this story to be to be told uh, abroad. Uh, and I think it's also uh, you know I think that anyone who means well about the country is happy when the country is doing well, and it's sad when the country is not doing um, uh, well. And I leave you know political preferences completely uh, aside, uh, and I think there are reasons um, uh, to to honestly believe. Regardless of what people vote, um, uh, and uh, and I think sometimes the, the Greeks who live abroad have a much clearer perspective of what's happening in Greece. We sometimes get bogged down in, in into party politics uh, way too much. But if you objectively look at uh, uh, at Greece from abroad, uh, the country is moving in the right direction. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, officially our time is over. If we could have five more minutes from your time. If not, we will move very fast to, to a final question from both of us. I think we can have, I think we can have five more minutes. Okay, great. So, uh, from the Endeavor Greece Network, we saw two record-breaking exits last year. Microsoft acquired Softomotive and Delivery Hero acquired Instashop. At the same time, your government has introduced many incentive schemes to enhance uh, Greece's competitiveness as a place to live and work. You mentioned before, tax cuts for entrepreneurs and employees. Um, for th that they wish to relocate, tax benefits for foreign retirees, the non-DOM program, and most recently a regime for the establishment of family offices in Greece, which, if you allow me, maybe some, has uh, some room for improvement in order to compete better internationally. So Greece is in the center of global attention, bearing the promise for a prosperous economy. How can we make Greece a significant destination for, for tech investments, but in, in, in other words, and in more general sense, what is the narrative, Mr. Mr. Prime Minister? Well, uh, I think the successes you, um, you presented are very, very important uh, in terms of determining, in terms of showing to the, the global tech world that there are opportunities in Greece that are worth exploring and possibly worth uh, investing in. Uh, and uh, you know how a vibrant uh, tech ecosystem works, and I think we, we have the you know, foundations uh, to actually do that, you know, and attract more capital uh, and make sure that uh, companies grow. There's probably, I think there is a problem in connection. Um, Let's hold off for a second and see what happens. Yeah, Maybe at some point they will need to move abroad and establish their headquarters uh, elsewhere. And that is, that is perfectly fine um, uh, if that is what needs to happen for them to grow. But we still want them to retain um, their, uh, their Greek roots. But I think there's also uh, another, uh, another aspect uh, of the tech ecosystem which is worth exploring, uh, what we call the digital nomads. Uh, people who can literally work from anywhere, um, uh, sometimes are self-employed or work in small teams. Uh, and uh, uh, the pandemic has proven that uh, you can actually work from anywhere, as we, uh, as we previously uh, discussed. And, uh, and those people, we, we already see them uh, looking at Greece and uh, them spending more time in Greece, investing in real estate, investing, uh, you know, in setting up maybe uh, a small, you know, uh, uh, you know, legal foundation in order for them uh, to do business. This is also, you know, another very important, quote-unquote, market we need to uh, we need to address because the the nature of work uh, is uh, is changing, and, and there I think we have, uh, you know, we have a unique uh, competitive advantage, which is a combination of uh, the quality of life, which is so uh, important and is going to become even more important. You know, excellent connectivity. One of the first countries to launch our, you know, 5G option, uh, you know, auctions. Uh, you know, a safe country. You know, the pandemic proved we, in spite of all the criticism, we have a good healthcare uh, system. And you don't actually need to work in Athens. Huh? You can work from an island. Uh, you can work from a nice village um, uh, in, uh, you know, in the in the mountains, uh, and uh, you know, be very happy and live a very fulfilling life and contributing to the Greek economy. So this is another niche, and it's not a niche. It's an important, you know aspect of the of, of the tech uh, industry we also need to um, uh, to focus on so last question we promise uh, 
Greek tech companies have grown from close to zero to, it is 10 years ago, to its estimated a market cap of about four billion today. And Endeavor has played a significant role in several of those success stories. And the outlook looks promising. The first Greek unicorn, we hope, is not very far off. Several forward-looking Greek companies outside the tech industry are also transforming and digitizing. So innovative Greeks aspire to turbocharge these trends. It is aiming to bring together the global community of Greeks working in tech, life sciences, or innovating in any other field, as mentioned earlier by the key instigators. So to spur networking, mentoring, partnerships, cross-border collaborations, business and career opportunities. And let me take this opportunity on behalf of both Costanza and myself to publicly thank the Endeavor and SEV teams who have brought this initiative this far and set up this, this fantastic uh, event. And although it is clearly a collective effort, I would be amiss if I didn't single out Marcos Veremis, whose brainchild or possibly love child this has largely been. Thank you, uh, Marco. So with that, Prime Minister, what would be your parting message to the over 10,000 people who have already signed up and are following Innovative Greeks? Continue to engage with the country. Uh, follow what's happening uh, in Greece. Uh, look for opportunities uh, in Greece. Uh, you know, help us uh, change the country by contributing to Greece's success. And as we discussed, there are many ways of actually doing this. Some of you will choose to return to, to Greece um, uh, for the next chapter of your life. But for those of you who will choose to, um, uh, to live abroad, uh, uh, you will always retain an interest in what is happening in Greece. And as Dimitri pointed out, there are many, many ways of actually helping uh, the country uh, and be part of the success story uh, of, uh, of what we're trying to do. And again, if we, if we could turn innovative Greeks into innovative Greece, um, that would be a tremendous success. And I think we would all be very, very happy and very proud if we could actually uh, succeed in doing that. Prime Minister, thank you very much for a very insightful conversation. Everyone at home, thank you very much for joining us for the first day of this, um, of this event, the Innovative Greeks Conference. Join us again tomorrow tomorrow afternoon with interesting discussions that will take place uh, with renowned Greek business leaders and investors. Good night, everyone.